and welcome to another exciting episode of That's Wild. Welcome back everyone and uh, if you haven't got your latest remembering book yet you definitely need to rush out and go get remembering leopards there's some spectacular photographs of leopards from all over the world and a few leopards that I know a lot of you know quite well um, let me see where is it now I can't remember where it was um, but yes I am very excited one day to go see Sri Lankan leopards that's on my bucket list of things to do so remember, you just go to Remembering Wildlife um, on social media or on the interwebs and you can order your Remembering Leopards book. And of course, if you are loving the books, you can also get the rest. Wild dogs, lions, rhinos, um, and get your whole collection of Remembering Wildlife books. Um, incredible work done there by Margot. Uh, over a million pounds donated to different conservation organizations throughout the world from the Remembering series. Okay, now, of course, this is gonna be a quite a bit, of, a bit of a strange one for me today because we have a special guest in the studio today and it is, of course, none other than my dad. Hi, Dad. Hello, Brent. Yeah. Um, so, Gareth was uh, supposed to be doing this interview. Unfortunately, he's, he's quite um, ill. So, Dad, um, I think it's your turn to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a, a little bit about yourself. Well, I um, was born in Zambia, and uh, but don't remember too much. I grew up in South Africa. Uh, my parents were from South Africa, and uh, mostly my school life um, up to the end of high school was in Durban, a city on the east coast. And um, and then uh, I always knew from whenever I was young that I was going to be involved in two things: agriculture and wildlife. I don't know how because I had no background in it. I had no, family didn't have any involvement. Um, and when I finished high school, I moved to a, a small farm that my father had bought um, between the city of Peter Maritzburg and Durban. And then from there, I did a BSc Agriculture uh, while living on the farm and running the farm. I was running the farm from the time I was about 15. And, uh, and then went into the army for two years after five years at university. And during that time, I, uh, we managed to find a, a farm and we set up a, a family farm with cattle and wildlife, which was just an emerging industry at that stage, the, the whole wildlife industry. They changed the, the rules in South Africa, the tax rules. It was called the Game Theft Act. It had a big impact and largely what you see in South Africa as a result of that. And then um, got involved in various agribusinesses, including a real estate business focused on farm sales. And from that, we got given a farm to sell in northern KwaZulu Natal. And that's now become Pinda, which is a whole other story. And then from there, after a few years of getting Pinda going, moved to Botswana, lived there for nine years. Um, and set up condo safaris and then to Johannesburg which I never thought I would be living in a city again but I uh, did for seven years before moving down here to the Reed Sprite Game Reserve uh, just over 10 years ago. I can't believe it's been 10 years already in, yeah. in, in Hood Sprite. Um, I, I, Gran used to say when you were little uh, living in Durban you always had different uh, dead insects or whatnot in your pockets that they always had to check them before laundry. Yeah I always used to collect things. Yeah. yeah. Um, so did you, by the way. <laughs> I know. I still do, and yeah. so do you. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a little, a little background. Uh, of course, currently you're also involved up in Gabon at the moment. Um, it's projects up there, um, which is a whole other story which we'll probably touch on a little bit later. But I think for, for a lot of people, they would be most interested about sort of the history of, of Pinda and 
because I mean that was groundbreaking. No one had ever really taken farmland and turned it back yeah. to full wildlife. Yeah, I mean, it, the, in a sense, the Sabi Sand area was cattle farms, but they were really struggling because of the wildlife coming out of the Kruger Park and killing all the cattle. And they converted many years ago, so it was a, a long time back. It wasn't really a conversion, it was the same owners. But what we did is we saw this land, and uh, it's very easy to do nowadays with digital things, but then we had to do it manually. And we had to go and search maps and deeds office and plot owners and things. And we eventually worked out that this game ranch that we were offered for sale sat literally between Mkuzi, uh, uh, Lake St. Lucia, and Shishlu and Falozi, the three big parks in KwaZulu-Natal. And that was the, the key they wanted to, to form the Greater St. Lucia Wetland Park, now known as Isis Mongoliso um, Wetland Park. Um, was this land in between that's pinned up. And so we started with that uh, concept and we had to buy up, uh, raise the money. You know, I was in my late 20s, try and raise the money. This was 1986. Um, and put a plan together to, to buy up that land and then merge it to create the, the sort of, or to help create the Greater St. Lucia Wetland Park. That never quite worked out that way in the end, but, but um, the concept uh, did and we managed to buy up the land after many, there's a whole book in the story, but uh, because we had our bank go bankrupt, we had the government tell us that they were going to expropriate the land, uh, all sorts of things. And then uh, we started with the, the political changes in South Africa with the unbanning of the ANC and the release of Nelson Mandela. And we were in the teeth of that trying to raise capital to put together this uh, new reserve, which somehow we managed to do it despite all the odds. And in about uh, end of 1989, we ended up buying uh, the core land that became part of Pinda. And uh, by 1990, uh, Pinda became a fact. And so that's now, what, 33 years ago. And the land value went from 1,250 rand a hectare, I don't know what it was in dollars in those days, but um, to today where you, you're probably paying 60, 70, 80,000 rand a hectare for that same land. And that gives you over a 20% compounded return for 30 years, which is probably better than investing in most tech companies. No. Now, um, I mean, that, but even in the early days, there were still gaps in between. So you had Pinda North and Pinda South, and you had to yeah. drive around to go. You couldn't drive through a reserve. You had to go out onto the main road. Yeah, I mean, when we got the two neighbours involved, they didn't want to, to agree to, to joining us in the beginning. They thought that we were going to fail and they didn't want to give up what they had. And then we managed to get a lease over a farm called Lulubush from the Van Rensburg family. And then the Bumbeni section in between then came in. And now the, that we formed then the Munyawana Game Reserve, which is based on a river through the middle. And now that Munyawana Game Reserve is over 25,000 hectares and we were originally when we first started 12,500 so it's doubled in size over the 30 odd years to a big chunk of land and that entire Zuland region has converted from agriculture to wildlife so the total area of land that's converted to wildlife is probably of the order of two, 300,000 hectares so that's a million acres and the value of that area has probably gone up by a factor of 30 or 40 in the 30 years. So we've proven that wildlife was a more valuable uh, land use than agriculture. Oh, well, we're going to cut you short there for now um, and we're going to go into some of the safari highlights um, from the private live and pack drives and uh, Gareth had a spectacular sighting of one of our favorite characters on the Reeds Bright Reserve. No Hope, the rhino, and her little calf being very, very cute. And uh, it's not often, um, I, I don't think I've ever seen a rhino that decides to pick up a stick. Obviously just curious and playing the little one. Um, I don't think there's too much behavior in it. But um, it is quite interesting, Dad and I were talking about it beforehand, that No Hope's calves seem to be very well behaved compared to other rhino no, they're calves. They're much more muted. They tend to stay close to her and don't run around. You know? Yeah, so a lot of other rhino calves, I think um, it's Sing my Singita's calf, yeah. likes to come charging the vehicle and run around and stomp around. There's no hopes, it seems to be a little bit more sedate, but there we go. Very, very cute, playing with a stick. Um, and then, uh, 
and then of course we had uh, Gareth been having some great, well, we've all been having some great sightings of the three Ritzbrait male lions. Old Hopalong was not too far behind these two at the, at, at, on this day, um, but having a drink at Borskamp. Now, they've been scrapping with each other quite a bit at the moment. There's quite a few of them have got holes all over their heads and whatnot, I think. It's the one on the right they had quite a, 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 a big bite mark on his head. It could also be from the girls. Um, but of course, lions do like to fight, particularly when there's food involved. And uh, it's been a cat-filled week uh, as well. And uh, the male cheetah have been giving us some great sightings. And they've been eating well. I think this is the third kill they've been found on in the last little while. And isn't that beautiful? I think this might have been with you, Andrew. The cheetah boys on the fence, not with Gareth. Sorry, apologies. But they have settled in incredibly well into the reserve. Although mm. one did go visiting next door for a little bit, um, but managed to get him back. But that looked like he chased a impala through the fence. Through, yeah. Yeah. He was full and fat on the other yeah. side. Here we go. And they've had a few run-ins with the lions, but so far they've managed to avoid them quite well. Here we go on a young male impala. Ah. And of course, uh, we're just going to give you a quick update on my favorite new residents of the Reeds Brates. It's of course the wild dogs in the Boma. They're habituating nicely. Obviously, they were quite skittish. I mean, they were darted, they were shot at, they were chased by cars, they had to run across main roads. So they were a bit jumpy for a while, but they're definitely um, getting nice and relaxed now. Uh, of course, those of you on the drive this afternoon would have seen them. And uh, like all dogs, they do like a bit of water. So they actually quite often like to jump into their water trough uh, to cool down. And uh, of course, Eileen is uh, there's a nice, very nice shot of Eileen. You can see how well Eileen is moving uh, on three legs and the incredible work done by uh, Dr. Debbie English at ProVet. Uh, that's just, I mean, look how well that is healing. It is an absolutely spectacular job. Obviously a very com complicated thing, having to remove a whole shoulder, yeah. lots of layers of stitches um, to make sure that that worked well. Now, we're gonna go to a quick little break and we'll see you in a minute or two. Welcome back. So we were chatting about Pemda and now how yeah. it's now, I think it's actually bigger than 30,000 hectares. I think it's close to 40 now. Yeah, if it you, could be. I'm if not you sure. include Sungula, the Morrisons, all that. Sungwana, no, but they, they, that's, that's all that included. Okay. But, you know, yeah. but yeah, it is, uh, I was lucky enough to spend some time down there recently. Where was it? Oh, you went back for the reunion. Yeah, it was, that was a while, a while ago. ago. Yeah. yeah. 25 years. So, so that's yeah. eight years ago. Eight years ago. But I was um, there February last year. Yeah. No, two years ago. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I always, I mean, we've, we've got to go back for, for the elephants, which was mm. quite fun. Uh, we even stayed in Swilly's. Okay. Um, which is the, our first house at Penda. Mom was not too impressed with that house because it didn't have a door and the hyena kept trying to fight with the dog. Dad spent quite a few nights chasing the hyena away from the house because it wanted to fight with the dog. Yeah. What else happened at Swilly's? I can't remember. Oh, black rhinos. Yeah. Lots of black rhinos. Um, 
But of course, I mean, what was the most challenging animal to bring back? But obviously, with being surrounded at that time by cattle farms and well, look, getting getting permission to bring in lions was a was a big thing. Well, predators generally, but lions in particular. So the farmers had all sorts of stories that they had heard and imagined, and these become the sort of old wife tale or what do you call it, urban legends of how lions can go into areas and kill 25 head of cattle in one go, which of course doesn't really happen. Um, what would happen if lions did get into a, a, a boma with some cattle in where they where they held for overnight for some reason? They, when they're hungry, they the instinct to, to kill, they just chase anything. And so if they grabbed one and killed it, another one ran past. Before they've started feeding, they would grab the next one. And they would end up killing four or five out of 25, but they wouldn't kill 25. So in the end, how we managed to solve this is we got a bunch of data together. We went to an insurance company and we said to them, okay, we will insure uh, your cattle against uh, lion attacks. Um, and that would cost, or it would cost very little because it was a very low risk. And we, I can't remember now, I think it was 50, 50 animals in any one incident. And then that dropped that argument. And so they, they kept finding new arguments to, to, to try and stop us from releasing them. And eventually, I was still living in Peter Maritzburg, running our businesses and coming up to Pinda for a couple of days a week uh, while we were still getting things going. And we were still removing farm infrastructure and building old buildings and putting up fences and doing all those things. And Les Carlyle was negotiating with all the farmers and he was doing a really good job of keeping them happy. It was quite a quite a big job. Big job because there were different farmers associations that we had to deal Sorry with. Sorry guys, the wind is blowing sand up. Yeah. It's very windy tonight. So we had to get that thing and then he he had a meeting at the Biela Farmers Association and I just moved up uh, permanently at that point and um, and I went to that Biela Farmers Association and they started going on and saying well you know the the 50 head of cattle wasn't enough and they, they heard that they could do more and kill more animals so I said fine we'll double it to a hundred and then I issued an invite to our release of the lions and I said look sorry we, you're now just being unreasonable we're going to go ahead and we're going to release them and we invited them to the party and surprisingly quite a few pitched up and that was that and there was never really a big drama after that. They, I don't think the lions ever ate any uh, domestic animals. As far as I know they haven't and, yeah. and never did. Yeah. Uh, and I think one thing that stands out for me as a kid was the, the first big fence party. Well that, that was the same, same thing. So, yeah, so. so we released the lions and we pulled down the fences between the two sections and we invited people there, um, the neighbors and the farmers and so on, and again, quite a few pitched up and, uh, you know, from the local uh, KwaZulu community next door as well. And we had a big party with uh, thing and the, the, the community came and did their proper traditional Zulu dancing with the thing. And, and uh, what was very interesting is one of the people who'd been opposing us all along, he helped jump and push fences over and got really involved in the spirit of the thing. And that was a big change for that whole area. It, it sort of, it just took away the, the years of negotiation to get all that done and it was not, it was over. And after that now it's been pretty settled. And, and also one of the, the, the big things that Pinda did to create in that area was, was jobs. Oh yeah. So we, we at, at peak we had about 620 people working on the building site and on the reserve. And we settled with a regular staff of about 400 people and your dependency ratio is about 10 to 1. So, you know, that's about 4,000 people and there were 22,000 people living in the perimeter of Pinda. So it was a significant difference. Now, one of the mistakes we made is we didn't do baseline data. Um, so we should have gone into the community and gone to their shops, which are known as spazas, which is a local word for a small shop, little general dealer. And they had things like tobacco and um, maize meal or corn meal, uh, cooking oil, you know, very basic uh, products on their shelves. Now they've got supermarkets and these things and there's only one reason that they're all there is because the economy that's created around the tourism industry that Pinda was the key to unlocking. Simultaneously with us, Natal Parks Board did build the hilltop facility at Shishlui and Falozi and that was 400 beds at a much lower price point 
we did a bigger turnover in our, what did we have, 70 beds. Um, but, but at the end of the day, that fundamentally changed the entire direction of the region from an agricultural region focused on cattle and pineapples to a region now that's exclusively focused on wildlife and tourism. And uh, it changed everything for everybody in the area. Good. I, I, as I said, if I, when we're up there now, there's Airbnbs, there's little tented yeah. camps on small reserves. There's, it's just that whole area is, is, is full of yeah. well, wildlife now. It was a big biodiverse area. The, what I often tell people is that there are no new special areas in Africa. So everybody likes to feel that they come out and go into a country and they're going to find this new undiscovered wildlife paradise. Well, it doesn't exist. The best areas in Africa were known um, 150 years ago already. The hunters and the Zululand was one of them. And what happened in Zululand is that when the Rinderpest outbreak, which is late 19. 1800s, 1800s into the 1800s. early 1900s. Um, it came in through Ethiopia and the Italians brought it in from, I uh, can't remember, Indonesia, I think it was. And that rinderpest just ran through the whole of Africa. Because so I think a lot of people might, might not know what the rinderpest is. It's a disease. Yeah. And it's a very infectious disease and it's very, it's lethal for ungulates, uh, animals with cloven hooves or, or hooves. And so it started wiping out a lot of animals, including cattle, right throughout uh, Africa. And it ran from the north to the south over a, a five-year period. And it ended up here in the low felt, and it changed everything for the low felt because the drop in those ungulate numbers led to the elimination of the tsetse fly. And that's opened up agriculture in the low felt where we are now. And Zuland. No, Zuland never got opened up because there are four, t four species of tsetse fly. Oh and they never managed to, to get rid of them all. Some of them adapted to the to living off uh, the other species like elephants and so on that, could, uh, that didn't get affected. And uh, so they had a big problem. And then in the, in the late 1940s, 1950s, just after the Second World War, they had a big extermination campaign to try and tame Zuland. And they literally shot hundreds of thousands of animals trying to eliminate them and eventually they worked out that the tsetse flies were sleeping in, in riverine trees and uh, they would be there overnight and they, st and they started spraying DDT and that's how they finally got rid of it. By that stage of course they got rid of all the animals in Zuland so Zuland never became a tourism destination and that was one of the key facts that I used to to bring it into a Zuland dest uh, into a tourism destination again is that it was one of the prime areas and now is again. And so that was a key um, sort of change in that area. And then we had to reverse it back to where all these species that were eliminated. Now lions and even elephant in that, that part where, where Pinda was had been eliminated about 100 years before. So getting all that back in again was a key, key, a key achievement actually. The, el the elephants were, caused quite a bit of drama though. Yeah, I mean... At that stage, the the ability to move elephants was was considered a um, mechanical problem, and the Kruger National Park was the sole source of elephants. They were culling surplus elephants in the Kruger Park at that stage, being a fenced reserve, and uh, with lots of man-made water points, they ended up with with uh, the elephants achieving about five and a half percent compounded growth rate, which means your population doubles every 12 years, and um, so they. They started culling and, and they used to eliminate entire herds and then um, adults and the babies and then they decided that that there was a market for the uh, juveniles that were easy, easy to move. So the sort of 10 to 16 year old or 15 year old elephants um, and we brought in about 30 of these elephants and they'd been released into Pilanisberg National Park uh, north of Pretoria and into Shishlu and Falozi Reserve, which is about 100,000 hectares or 250,000 acres um, nearby. And at that stage, those elephants had now started becoming in the early 20s. And they, um, the young bulls, without having adult bulls to discipline them, started killing rhino, rhino. and it was a regular problem. They were, they were really delinquents. And we then decided we needed to bring in some adult elephants. And at Pinda, the, our lot were just like ghosts. You only saw tracks and dung. Mm. They just avoided being seen. I think seen. I can remember seeing yeah. them once across the airstrip at Israelita. Yeah. And it was a big deal because they yeah. were seen during the day. So we had no sightings of elephants at all. And so Kruger Park said, no, it was too big a problem. Moving a six-ton bull is so strong and so on. My, my father was a mechanical engineer. 
I knew it was just a mechanical problem to solve and you can easily make a crate strong enough. And in the end, uh, with Trevor Jordan, who's from the Low Felt here, and in fact, he's got a kind of a manor house on the Reedsbrad Game Reserve, um, we got together and arranged with a Zimbabwean guy called Clem Kutsia. And he said if he's got a market for, for adult elephants or family groups, he will move them. And so Trevor was developing thorny bush here in the Low Felt. And uh, so he took a, a family group of adults and we took a family group of adults to, to Pinda. And they settled down very well. I think there were nine of those. And um, they included um, cow, adult cows, but we, didn't, we only got about a 15-year-old bull, which wasn't really big enough. And I think that embarrassed the Kruger Park people. And the next year they said, oh, they could, they could de deal with that. And so we got 13 adults, including about a 20-year-old, 21-year-old bull. Uh, that was the biggest that they were prepared to move at that stage. And we brought them across. And we thought they needed to be bomered. And that's another whole story because Pinda was a pioneer of bomering predators. Um, and we used to put elephants in bomers, but actually they're not territorial and they don't need a bomber. So nowadays you just release them straight from the trucks. But put them into the bomber and the, the car, they'd been experimenting with um, new uh, drug cocktails. And they created one that was euphemistically called Kani Warini. And for those who don't speak Afrikaans, it means I couldn't be bothered. Don't worry. And, uh, and, it, and it turned out to work really well. And this elephant car ignored the electric fences and the poles. And she was, at night we could see her getting shocked. You could see the sparks jumping and she just ignored them and kept working the gate, which she picked up as being a weak point until she broke out. And then she got the herd to follow her and got to, uh, walked until they got to one of our fences. And then she broke out the fences and the herd were too scared to go through because they, didn't, they weren't given that uh, cocktail. And for the next day and a half, she broke in and broke out and broke in and broke out. And we had a team of guys, um, young guys, uh, Carl Rosenberg and uh, John Raw and Colin Bennett, just running behind them, fixing the fences as they broke out and broke back in again and so on. And the, the herd wouldn't go with her. And eventually after the second night, uh, well, during the early, very early morning, the herd followed her, and unfortunately they followed her through into the tribal areas of Mwabagazi. And they knocked over a house on the way through, and they ended up in the Mkuzi floodplain at the top end of Lake St. Lucia. And we knew that if they got into that uh, papyrus reed beds of, of you know, 20,000, 30,000 hectares, we would really never be able to get them out. It's mud and water and things like that. So we took a decision against the advice of everybody in the Kruger Park and so on. And we had, People were telling you to shoot them. Well, we were getting told to shoot by the Kruger Park and by other people who I won't name at this stage. <laughs> but, um, and I refused. I said, no way. If, if we shot those elephants, they would deem moving adult elephants to have been a failure. And it isn't. It was just a drug cocktail problem that can get fixed. And we decided to, to try and save those elephants. And so we, we managed to, uh, well, we had enough M99. In those days, uh, using M99 wasn't restricted. You could get non-vets uh, with, vet, uh, with a training, could, had a license to, to use M99. So Les Carlisle and Martin Rickleton, who both worked for us at Pinda, they had their drug licenses. And so we started dropping these elephants um, initially just uh, from from the ground but we bell equipment which is a big uh, yellow but we're gonna have to wait yeah, okay. till after the next break to find out what happened with the elephants
Welcome back. back. Okay, carry on. <laughs> All right, so we then got a helicopter from Bell Equipment and they very happily uh, flew up from Richards Bay, which is probably 30, 40 minutes by helicopter and, and helped us dart the others. In the meantime, Pete Rogers, yes, who you've so. spoken to before, he was the chief vet for Natal Park Sport and he was far away in a place called Wienan. Um, dealing with some buffalo down there and we managed to get hold of him and he came with a, a legendary helicopter pilot uh, Führer. Führer van Heerden yeah. and uh, they flew up bringing some more drugs but they but we also knew we were going to run out of M99 and we were going to do something that had never been done before give multiple doses of M99 to these elephants the, the opinion at that time was that if you gave multiple doses you'll kill them and also if you let elef elephants lie on their side, they were going to die. Their weight would crush their lungs and they had problems. And if we flipped them over, they would get their stomach in a twist and that would cause them to die. And we were going to do all those things um, because I had a plan in my head because we didn't have equipment to deal with them. So I got hold of a guy I was at school with, uh, Leo Matioda, and he had a big um, earth moving plant hire business in Richards Bay. And Greer, my wife, called him up and said, listen, Leo, we need urgently to, get, to move some elephants, uh, two low bed uh, trucks and trailers with some big excavators and some cargo nets from the harbour that are big enough to fit an elephant in and we need them now. And uh, you remember we don't have cell phones in those days or any of these things, all done by radio to a landline which then phoned and so on and he, he was, Leo was always keen for anything and he sent his trucks and we had somebody meet them in Shishlui and take them through the bush. And by the time uh, it was getting dark, Pete Rogers landed with the uh, with Fira and the chopper there. And also, um, we had to go to Pete uh, Rogers' house. Had to break into his house. Had to break into his house. He lived in a place called Monzi, which wasn't too far away on a golf course, um, in a sugar farming area. And we had to break into his house to get the extra M99 out of his fridge. Um, so that we had enough to go through the night. And then we got a whole bunch of lanterns, these same lanterns like these. And we put them next to each elephant because they were all in different places. So we had uh, these 13 elephants dotted around in this num num bush, which is a very unpleasant, horrible, it's got a horrible thorns thing. like this, scratching our legs. And, um, and we had all the local people that lived nearby, they'd never seen elephant, all standing around trying to watch the elephants. And we're trying to explain to them that with M99, an elephant goes from fast asleep to standing in about two minutes, with, uh, even without an antidote. And they didn't believe us until this bull stood up and I was standing next to the bull and I had to hang on to his tail and I shot for Pete Rogers and he had to come in and inject it into the caudal vein. We didn't have all these head torches and things, somebody holding a torch while they're trying to hang this thing. And if, if I just got a prick from M99, it would have killed me. So Pete was trying to not jab me and jab into the caudal vein, uh, vein in the tail of an elephant that was walking, <laughs> slowly but walking the bush but that was enough to scare off all the the uh, the rented crowd that we had well someone did try to steal a tail yeah one guy did try and cut the tail off one of them um, as a as a souvenir um but anyway, he, he didn't succeed um so we went through the night and then well not through the whole, about probably about nine o'clock at night we heard the trucks arriving and we could see them they looked like strange um, dinosaurs coming through with the, with the lights on the on the excavators on the back of the of the low beds pushing the low beds through the sand because they were getting stuck and pushing them as we're going through the thing and, and eventually they took quite a while to get through the sand to us and then we put the cargo nets next to the elephant tied a rope around their feet flipped them over into the cargo net and then hooked the cargo net into the bucket of the excavator put them onto the low bed, chained them on their side using the same chains that, that held the excavators in place and then Martin Rickleton would travel, uh, put a motorbike on the back put a, uh, and travel with the, the truck um, back sometimes with the smaller elephants who managed to fit two on low bed but mostly it was just one at a time and then the excavators would have to follow them pushing the, the back of the trailer through the sand until they got onto the harder road and then take them about the 30 kilometers around to where the boma was and Les Carlisle had had a car accident and had cracked ribs so he took charge of rebuilding the boma and we rebuilt the boma without a gate because that was the weak point and then we had a Natal Parks Board um, rhino capture truck that had a high up crane which is a hydraulic crane that, that's fitted onto the truck and that was going to 
lift the elephants and fling them over the fence and put them inside the, 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 the boma. And when the adult cows got there, it, they were probably three, three and a half tons. But with the extended arm, this five ton high up couldn't lift them. And so I got an, an SOS that there was a problem with the thing. And I knew the solution, my father being an engineer, as I mentioned before, he taught me all these things. So I got in a motorbike and rode, rode back there and I got the driver distracted and I just screwed down the, the relief valve on the on the hydraulic relief valve on the on the control valves and probably set it to about six ton which is well beyond its its design um, safety and it managed to pick these elephants up and managed to get them over the fence but by the time the sun was rising the next morning we managed to have got all the elephants loaded and there were the last ones were on the low beds heading back to the boma we decided to give a scoline injection to the matriarch because she'd now learned to ignore electric fences and we didn't want to start that again scoline's a, a lethal injection sometimes in wildlife you've got to take hard decisions but the rest of those elephants and including the elephants here in the red yeah. and the and and the bull the bull was born from one of those elephants uh, that arrived then and so he was a kruger park bull that's why we were quite happy to take a, that bull to to mate with the elephant cows here because we know they're not related because he was actually she his mother arrived pregnant with him and um so the big bull yeah yeah, yeah from Nambiti, yeah yeah and so he went from there to nambiti but he's he's originally born on pinda and with the 22 months gestation we knew that that's basically if you work it all out 33 years yeah. it all adds up and um so we managed to get those elephants back. They finished their time in the Boma. We released them as planned and they're still living happily ever after. And even some of those cows here could be from the original, well, are highly likely to have been from either the original Kruger Park females or alternatively even one of those from Zimbabwe or the Kruger Park. We don't actually know. So that was the story. So when it was all finished, it was an interesting little thing. We, I hadn't slept for two days. John Raw and his team hadn't slept for three days. So we all got back home and it was about 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, went to sleep and my house was at the end of the airstrip and a helicopter landing woke me up, landed right outside our house. And it was the one person who was telling me that I should shoot them with a media crew giving them the story on how he saved the elephants. So. Yeah, the person who shall not be named for now. But okay, well, I think we've chatted quite a bit about Pinda, um, um, but I think let's chat a bit closer to home. So. Uh, what is your role at the Ritzbrat Game Reserve? Well, I'm a resident and owner of a stand on, on Leadwood, which is a, if you can imagine, a golf estate, except it's not a golf estate, it's a wildlife estate. So you've got these houses with wildlife in between, not, not as many houses as would be on a golf estate. And, um, and then Leadwood is part of the Ritzbrat Game Reserve. It's made up effectively of four properties, three bigger ones, and one small one with the manor house. And uh, so when we got involved, uh, Trevor Jordan was the developer and that was about 2010, uh, tw 2008, sorry, and they had the 2008 financial crash. So they relaunched it again in 2010. And we bought then, and although we only moved here 2013, um, and so I volunteered to be the the honorary reserve manager and so I look after the reserve and, and uh, got involved in developing the management plans to be able to bring all the big animals in and uh, you know the elephants were effectively the last of the of the the big introductions and so that's well, what buffalo I basically, maybe still to come well in the buffalo is complicated because we're in a buffer zone between what's known as the red line which is the road between us and the Kruger Park um, where those are disease buffalo for foot and mouth disease, which is another very infectious disease and it can shut down agriculture. So the veterinary authorities are very tightly controlled. Although they've had and our western fence. Buffalo uh, yes, with foot and mouth no. living with cows at Honest Port for like 10 years and there's never been transference. Well, not like 10 years, 50 years. 50 years, right. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a technical problem. Nobody really knows how it gets transferred. What we do know is that buffalo are test positive for it and cattle has a big impact it doesn't seem to have too much of an impact on buffalo and so we are uh, restricted we can get buffalo if we put a double fence around our 47 kilometer boundary and that's quite expensive and ecologically unacceptable to me is that you'd have this 
fence five meters apart and would just erode and cause all sorts of problems with doing it. So, oh, and things like pangolins and tortoises. Yeah, it's, and just, it's just a big ecological issue, so we, we don't want to deal with that. So maybe one day, if we're lucky, there will be an outbreak of foot and mouth this side of the, the red line, and then we'll become part of the red line, and then it'll be easy. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to another quick break. Dear future filmmakers, Africa is calling. It's time to reawaken your wild. Painted Dog TV is offering an internship unlike any other. Join our pack and see the world through a whole new lens. Live and work in the beating heart of the South African bush. And become part of our mission to share it with the world. For the love of wildlife. For the storytellers of our future. Painted Dog TV Internships. Welcome back. Um, but so I think one question: What is the the most challenging thing about bringing animals back to a reserve like this? Or? Actually, nowadays it's not even a challenge. Um, back back when we started Pinda, quite a lot of challenges and things. There, there wasn't a big wildlife industry. You know, the people's equipment hadn't revolved. Re now, now literally, it's it's a case of you know the Good. hardest part of it is getting paperwork. And, uh, and making the arrangements, you know, it's the actual mechanics of capturing animals, transporting them, releasing them is, is, a, is a, something that goes very smoothly and is very easy to do nowadays. And, you know, if you take just the bombers that we alluded to earlier on, Natal Parks Board, uh, one day if you get Vincent here, yeah, he can give you all the details. But I think Natal Parks Board tried to release something like 400 cheetah mm -hmm. into KwaZulu Natal reserves and ended up with a zero result. And what happened is they'd bring them in a trailer, they would open the trailer, release them, hot, hot releases it's known, and these cheetah would just run off and in their brains people got this idea that they've got this very great sense of direction. There is a case of a cheetah that went a hundred and something kilometers back to where he was released, but mostly I, I believe they, don't, they, just, they just have a gut feel, like sometimes you get, you think that's where you're supposed to be and then you find out it's actually that direction when you've come into a new city and you've arrived and you don't and it was dark and so on and they just get this idea I need to go north and they they just go north and they either get killed or die or you know disappear um, and what putting them in a boma does is it, 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 it enables them to localize. So what we watched in the beginning, they run around the fences. Like any of you have been to a poor zoo, you'll see animals placing fences and things. They do that for a couple of days and start settling and then they realize food's coming and eventually after maximum two weeks normally they settle down. Our dogs are taking a bit longer because they're males and they keep wanting females. They were calling, calling, calling yeah. today. So they're trying to find females and once we've got some females they'll settle. And then when they settle and you find them just lying around waiting for the next meal, then it tells you that they've localized and that's when you can release them and they won't go running off to go somewhere else. And so that was part of what we've done. So that's why one of the first things you do when you've got a new reserve is you build a release boma and that's for the territorial animals. So any animal that's got territory, you set them up in a release boma. And uh, and release them that way. So you know that's, but it's not a it's not a big challenge anymore. Okay. And then um, well, we can chat a little bit about um, Botswana because that mm. was quite an adventure for all of us. 
Yeah. Oh, there's the hippos being released. Yeah. Um, but that was quite a big, um, big change for all of us. Yeah, I mean, Botswana, after I left uh, Pinda and Conservation Corporation, because out of Pinda we grew its own parent, a Conservation Corporation got involved in four countries, and we grew from zero to uh, 2,000 people in four countries in about four years. So we had lots of corporate issues, and, and some of them affected me, and, and uh, decided that, that it was time to move on after about 1996. So we really got started in 1989, so six, seven years. And uh, I wanted to get back into the, to the industry um, that I hadn't been in before, but I, I found it interesting. And uh, so we found an opportunity in Botswana, which was really a greenfields opportunity again, right up in the north of Botswana on the Namibian border. And that was Kwan on the Kwanda River. And uh, that concession had been won in a, in a, um, uh, a tender by John Maynard, who's a citizen of Botswana. And he, he wasn't very happy with that concession. He wanted another one. And uh, so he was thinking of getting out of it and we went to go and have a look. And I went with him and his brother and we looked through it and I said to him, you've actually got the best concession in Botswana. And they said, no, no, you don't know, you haven't been here and you know, you, you want anything. And I said, I can just tell by all the paths. Now we went there in the, in the rainy season, so you didn't see as many animals and we arrived in the middle of the day and there was no facility to stay at night, so we had to just come in and fly out again. But it was lagoon and the bala, but shot, oh, I suppose rainy season, they used to yeah, shut they, them up. And so they were closed for the, for the they were hunting areas before. And so um, I told them that those are the best areas I could see from the dung and the paths and you know the way the, the trees had been stripped by elephants and stuff like that. I could see there was the, that the animals were there. And uh, after talking to John, initially trying to buy the, the business from him, he got interested and he said, okay, why doesn't he go in with us? And so we went into a partnership and that's 232,000 hectares, so that's uh, 500,000 acres. Um, so it's a huge, huge concession with 80 kilometers of river frontage. And when we started developing it, of course, it turned out that, and I still believe this is true, is the best concession uh, in Africa. It's my uh, favorite place to you go can, on so far. You can argue that, that you can have a better wildlife spectacle experience in the Masai Mara and the, and the Serengeti, but it's not private. You, you just overrun with people. You've got no control over sightings and things like that. Whereas uh, in, the, in the dry season in that Kwanda concession, there's more elephant there than the entire country of South Africa has. Just to give you an example, and we only used to call in herds of a couple of hundred buffalo. We, we, you know, they, we just had up to 5,000 buffalo. So that was a, an interesting challenge. It was really in the middle of nowhere. Um, to get there took uh, 23 hours of constant driving with a tractor and trailer with, with uh, two drivers. That's our supplier system. And so it was an interesting challenge, and, and a, uh, we sp spent nine years there uh, getting that done. It was, was a very interesting time in our life, and Brent and Dylan were in their teens at that stage, or Dylan just about in his teens. And uh, so it was an interesting time, and then we got the Quarra concession as well, which was in the Okavango, and um, built a very nice business out of it. No, and I mean, I was very lucky. I, my favorite job was to drive the, when I didn't have a driver's license, mm. Um, the the game view is either to town yeah. or back or back to the bush after they're gone for service. So I had to leave at well, I used to leave at three o'clock in the morning so I yeah. could avoid all the police on the main road. And then once I was in the bush, I was happy as Larry to do a drive through the middle of the bush by myself for yeah nine hours at a yeah, time. Yeah, take eight, seven to nine hours depending yeah. on the time of the year. No, and we we obviously we um, well Barbara Connie Cookie actually just came up. We were at the Kwanda concession. Yeah. We saw 60 different lions yeah. in four nights. Uh, over a, over a thousand elephants every day. We're there at the right time of the year. I think we saw five different leopards, uh, wild dogs, uh, art wolf dens, yeah. um, sables um, fighting, r eland, roan. A lot, a lot of the interest people have in wild dogs nowadays actually came from those concessions because we used to, between the Quarra and the Kwanda concession, have anything up to four, even one year, five wild dog dens active almost simultaneously. And we brought lots of media, uh, mm -hmm. all sorts of media there to film the dogs and the dogs then became this the species that everybody wanted to see and, and didn't really know about until then. So it really put them on the map. Um, of course now, 
dogs are, are priority viewing for just about anywhere. So. Yeah. Right. That is a very, very, very special part of the world that, um, yeah. If you do get a chance to book a Panda Dog CV Safari to Botswana, we will definitely take you to Kondo. Um, yeah, it is, it's a very, 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 very special part of the world. But the whole history of how Botswana is what it is, is quite an interesting one. Because it's a country the size of Texas or France, so it's a biggish country. And Kenya is also about the same size, but it's only got two and a half million people today. And the majority of the people live on the eastern side of the country. And uh, so there's not a lot of people living in the remote rural areas. There are, but there's not a lot. And so the whole of northern Botswana, um, which is about 15, 20 million hectares, was divided up into three big hunting concessions, but they were year-to-year -year concessions, so there was no security of tenure. So the hunting companies never invested much in the area. They had these temporary camps and so on. And then in the early, late 1980s, early 1990s, they developed a plan to subdivide those areas and to grant joint hunting photo tourism concessions throughout that whole uh, block and that really encompasses the Chobe and, and uh, Okavango Delta, it's known as Ngami land. And the consultants that they got in to do, the, the European Union paid for consultants to go there, they're very good at donating money and then making sure you use their consultants. And they didn't really have all the expertise that was required. So what they did is they made these very big concessions. The, you know, Kondo being one of the biggest ones, but the smallest it's ones the biggest, were 25,000 hectares and then the other, most of them were 50 to 100,000 hectares. And those are big, big pieces of land. When you look at the average uh, Travis area for a safari lodge is five or 6,000 hectares, it gives you some idea. And they did that because they wanted, you were forced when you tended to run both photographic and hunting safaris on the same land. And they basically incompatible activities. Um, for all sorts of reasons, danger, and that was the reason why they thought they'd put these big areas, but because of the mindset to the logistics, the employment, the, the people you hire, the, it's just entirely different industries, they, they don't mix at all. And so what happened is they, they divided up these concessions, they got tendered, they um, set them out, and it didn't take very long for the, the photographic industry to take over and gradually they displaced it. But at that time there was a lot of interest in Botswana, which is the citizens of Botswana, in what they called citizen hunting. And they used to have a lottery because there was a greater demand for the permits to hunt than there were hunts available. And with these lotteries they became a big thing and then these people who won the lottery would come to your office and they would say, you know, I've got a permit for two Impala. Um, you know, the meat value is 200 Pula, but if you give me 400 Pula, I'll cancel the permit, you can take it and cancel it. So we started buying these hunting permits, and the other companies started doing that as well. And that way we, we sort of created a secondary industry, which was getting your permit and then selling it. So it was mainly buffalo and Impala and a few species like that. And gradually, the cell phones were emerging, this is 96, 97, um, and the cell phones changed everything. Uh, I, um, this is my opinion, I can't prove it, but suddenly people got more focused into technology, the world and the cities, and stopped being interested in the, in the rural areas, and the next generation decided that going hunting and living and camping in the bush and having lions come around you and just wasn't what they wanted to do and, and that problem just faded away and along with it the the hunting guys started uh, focusing on the concessions that were just mapani and mapani is a type of tree it's you get very little variety in it it's very monotonous and boring and hot and muddy in summer and and uh, you know the animals are there in summer and you can't really drive around without getting stuck and in the winter there's not much so you get the territorial animals so you'll get some buffalo you'll get some some uh, leopards, some lions, right. and that's what they focused on to, to try and hunt there in those concessions. And the prime areas that are now the core of the Botswana safari industry fo focused on, on photographic safaris. And in fact, they are now the most valuable um, safari concessions in the world by a long, long way. Um, in fact, they don't even trade, they're so valuable. The people just hold on to them. And northern Botswana is worth an absolute fortune due to photographic safaris and that mistake 
that they made of giving these big private areas. So those are the only areas other than privately owned land in South Africa where you get that big 5 and 48 hour specialization where you have exclusive use of an area, whereas everywhere else is shared. Yep, and we're going to chat a little bit more about that after the break. Welcome back, but quickly before we continue on, we're going to uh, jump into your viewer photos. So if you want to get your photo featured on That's Wild, um, you need to download the Paints Dog TV app and you can pop uh, the picture in there. There's a little tab called Your Photos and Videos. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, the first picture this week is from Michael Fleetwood of the Northern Avoca male lion. Um, he was trailing a herd of buffalo on Michael's first night on safari at Elephant Plains Game Lodge. Um, he did manage to grab one before the herd saw him off onto a neighboring property. Sounds like a fantastic sighting um, of that northern avoca in the northern Sabi Sands. And um, another northern Sabi Sands photo, um, this time from Joyce. M is a cheetah, a rare cheetah sighting on Buffalo's Hook, um, which is of course also in the northern Sabi Sands. And we did see cheetah there occasionally. Those, those males used to move through on the boundary of Kruger on those uh, open areas on the edges of um, the Sabi Sands where you start getting some of the basalt soils and the more open knobthorn savanna. So a lovely photo from Joyce. And that was in August 2022. And then, oh, still in the northern Sabi Sands. Um, one of, uh, I know a lot of people's favorite leopards uh, from Liz. This is Tiani, the female leopard. That is, if I remember correctly, Tandy's daughter. Is it Tandy's daughter? I think it is. Um, and of course, Tandy is the leopard on the cover of the Remembering Leopard book. Um, it is Tiani, gorgeous. And finally, we move far away from the northern Sabi Sands um, into the Serengeti. Uh, Julie, Julie's got a photo of a tree climbing lion in the northern or in the Serengeti. Uh, and of course, in the Serengeti in Mara, we find lions and Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda, and Lake Manyara, um, and occasionally in South Africa and Southern Africa we get lions and trees, but mostly, uh, particularly during the migration, the lions will climb quite often up into sausage trees, uh, they're easier to climb, and it's to get away from all the flies, so there's a little bit more of a breeze up there, um, and when the migration's around, the flies that are around the migration are just incessant. So the lions try to take a break from the biting flies by climbing up the tree. Okay, that's all our photos for today. Um, okay, so let me just double check where we are. Yes, so what were we talking about? I've forgotten now. Oh, um, we're talking about how northern Botswana yes, northern becomes Botswana. value. So that's resource e economics. I consider myself a resource economist, even though I studied animal science. Um, and my mission in life is to make sure that wildlife areas become valuable and, uh, and that we don't copyright what we do. We make it available for people and it's something similar to what we're doing in Gabon, but that's at a very different scale and much more complicated, where there's 730,000 hectares that we're dealing with there on an integrated sustainable development basis. But that's complicated for, too complicated for now, I think. Okay, so we are opening up the Q&A. So if you've got any questions for Dad, now is your chance. Um, there we go. So if, uh, just remember, you have to be a PAC member 
um, to ask questions and um, I'm sure there is a Charles will post up there um, about how you can become a PAC member. So PAC members, now is your chance uh, to, to ask any questions. Let me look. So who have we got here? We've got Hello Carol, Regula, Betty, uh, Michael, Jennifer, Wendy, uh, Willow, uh, Barbara, Di, Sue, Connie, uh, lots of people there. So if I, and Gareth Paul. <laughs> How's it, Gareth? Um, so if anyone does have any questions, now is your moment. Um, but in the meantime, um, I, would, I, I suppose it's a, it's, it's a bit of an interesting question, but what would you say hmm, is your favorite moment of the Ritzbrate animals? Ritzbrate animals, we'll keep it oh, easy. Um, I'm out twice a day, every day, so uh, I don't have any one that stands out in particular just trying to think. Actually, one of the interesting ones was the three male lines when I was building a road. Yes. Um, so I, one of the things I do, instead of going to a gym and paying somebody to help Shot me exercise, <laughs> I go, I, I spend about an hour every morning just either clearing branches on the road or making new tracks. So a lot of the tracks you'll see them going on that are not roads, uh, just two tracks through the bush are the things that I make. And one morning I was, I'd been making one because it depends where I end up on the game drive as to where I carry on working. So I've been building it from two different ends and I knew I was quite close to meeting, you know, a couple of hundred meters apart. So I didn't want to go and end up missing. So um, I decided to take my clippers with me, which are sort of big yellow uh, pruning tools that you use in the citrus orchards and things. And I was walking through the bush, it was probably about six o'clock and, you know, vaguely in the back of my mind, I knew that the lions were somewhere else. I hadn't heard them and they were probably quite far away, which is something you can never really make a, uh, an assessment of. And uh, walking through the bush and I found the other side and I said, OK, worked out where I was going to make these two meet. And it was only about a day's work to a day and a half's work to get through there. And as I turned around to come back there, I saw the first male lion following me. And uh, he froze when he saw me and uh, stood there. Now he was, and I knew the others were not far behind him, but I couldn't see them. And they were between me and the vehicle, and it was probably a good 200 meters away. So there was no point in trying to walk away from them because you know you, you're not solving the the issue. They were curious. They weren't. I mean, they. If I had carried on walking and ignored them, they probably would have tried to do something. But but at the end of the day, they the lions are always cautious during the day with, with uh, bipedal humans. And so I turned around and, and uh, shouted at him and uh, fortunately there was a, a rock nearby, I threw that at him and he moved off a little bit behind a gory bush, which those of you know, gory bush is quite difficult to see through. And, um, and so I had to walk back and there was a, the bush was very thick and so I knew I had to stick to that path. And uh, there was a dead tree next to me. so I. Took these clippers and I hit the dead tree. Unfortunately, the branch that I hit came off flying, which I was hoping to do because the turbine must have been hitting it. And that flew into that glory bush and gave them a little fright, and I, and I heard them move away. But I couldn't see them. Just one second. Which one, Vim? I think you might have put it on mute by accident in your pocket. Let me just have a look. Yeah, you muted yourself. There you are, you are unmuted. Okay. I'll put it in this pocket then. Um, so, anyhow, then I knew that they were behind the gory bush, but I didn't know whether they were right behind the gory bush or <laughs> further away. So, I picked up another rock and a branch, and I had my clippers and had to bend down to get underneath the thorn bush that was next to the gory bush and came out the other side. Unfortunately, they were probably, I don't know, from here to the fire away. Um, on the other side. So I threw the rock at them and shot at them and ran after them and they got a bit of a fright and they moved away. But when lions are interested, they sort of move away and then they turn around and look at you again. Yeah. And so I knew they were going to follow me all the way back to the vehicle. So I'd have to walk, you know, 10, 15 paces and then I'd have to turn around and shout at them again and they would stop and then they would wait again. I'd walk another 10, 15 paces and shout. And they did that all the way back to, to the vehicle. <laughs> Um, so that was probably one of the more interesting ones. Uh, is, uh, Michael Fleetwood, of all the creatures you've managed over the years, was Brent the hardest? 
<laughs> well, actually, probably not. He was certainly challenging, but uh, I've had a few staff members that were probably more of a challenge, but for, for all sorts of complicated reasons. Because when you live in these remote rural areas and you have these staff, they're with you 24-7. So dealing with all their problems, relationships and otherwise, um, is probably more of a challenge, but you know, Brent was busy. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, um, Barbara Russell, now, what or who was your inspiration to get into? Uh, probably, you got to think back to those days when, uh, you know, this was the 19, 1960s, early 1970s when I was at school. The, I used to catch a bus into the city and at the city hall they and the, had the museum next door and they used to have free, in those days, mostly black and white films showing on a Saturday morning from 10 until 12 o'clock. And uh, you just had to pitch, probably had about 30, 30, 40 seats. And one of the big films in those days was Bernard Grimek, the German uh, zoologist researching in the uh, in the Serengeti and the um, uh, Ngorongoro crater and he made a film called the Seren Serengeti shall not die and even from back then they were predicting the death of the Serengeti which was probably incorrect um, not, not understanding the resource economics of it but that was probably those types of films back in those days and even Elsa the Lion which makes me cringe today but but the, the Adamsons and their, their line, this idea of having this tame line, which is anathema to me now. Um, but those were the things. That's why I'm not against zoos, because uh, zoos, I, I, what I say to people, the people who love animals don't keep them in cages. But zoos perform a very important functions, and there's some very well-managed zoos around the world, and one of them gives people exposure that would never have exposure to wildlife. And I was one of those. There wasn't much of a zoo in Durban. It was more of a sort of a zoological garden. But I used to walk a couple of hours to go there and look at the birds and the, uh, that were around and the, and the smaller animals that they had. So that, that's really what got me started. Okay. Um, of, of the places you've lived, which is your favorite? And that is from? Betty. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very adaptable, so I enjoy wherever I am. So I really enjoy living in the Red Sprat Game Reserve at the moment. I enjoyed living in Botswana. Um, the downside of living in Botswana is that we lived in Mound, which is fine. Um, and the concessions were in the bush, but we were always so busy. You know, the nice, everybody thinks the safari industry is so relaxing and <laughs> all these things. But it's 24-7, never lets you go. When everybody's on holiday, you're at the busiest. And so uh, that's why I enjoy about the Reed Spread is I go on my own game drives twice a day. I don't have to do it for anybody else and so on. And, and when we're working in the safari industry, we didn't have that. But Pinda was fantastic. In fact, I've often been asked this, you know, what would you change? And, and I, I, even though financially I didn't do very well out of Pinda and I didn't do very well out of Botswana, I would still do them again because they were things that could only have been done at that time and can never be done again. They were windows of opportunity that presented themselves. And so Pinda was phenomenal um, and what we managed to achieve and all those things. So now I've, I've enjoyed every place I've lived. Even I was happy enough in Joburg, although Joburg wouldn't be my choice. Yeah. Um, Jennifer's got a good one. What would you now want to tell your younger self, re-land acquisition, conservation? Um, I learned about a thing called investment banking along the way and I didn't know anything about finance, I didn't come from that background, as I say my father was an engineer, um, but I would have learned a lot more about investment banking and corporate finance um, because that's the key to how you put these things together. So derivatives and various things like uh, carbon credits and biodiversity credits, something we could have tackled a long time ago. Um, it didn't need the climate crisis to make those things valuable. So that's probably what I would have told you, which is probably not what you're expecting, but, but finance drives everything. If you understand that, you understand everything. Um, other than your children, what do you think is your greatest accomplishment from Barbara? Pinda would have to be, because that changed everything. So the whole way people converted farmland into, uh, into wildlife areas 
and made live wild animals valuable was something that Pinder made obvious. We weren't the only ones, but we were the biggest at the time, but there's been lots of Me Too since then. Oh, Thorny it, Bush. Yeah, the, well, Thorny Bush was some, a different model, but, but, but Trevor was doing that at the same time. Swale. But Swale and all those followed, but yeah. Yeah, and, and the Eastern Cape yeah, and et cetera. So it created, and, it, and, it, and the, 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 the luxury safari industry as we know it today also came out of Pinder. Um, we thought that raising capital uh, was the one of our unique sources and, and uh, my partner Alan Bernstein uh, was the specialist in that corporate finance even though he has an MSc in, in civil engineering he focused on corporate finance and he taught me what I know about it and um, we thought that being able to build these luxury lodges was going to be our unique source and other people wouldn't do it but every single very rich guy came out and said, whatever you can do, I can do better. And it started an arms race, which I think has reached a point of, of extremism now. No, no. Um, my decorator. And uh, sort of my decorator is better than your decorator, Safari. His bathroom but, is bigger yeah. than yours. And, and uh, but, but at the end of the day, that is uh, definitely the thing. Okay. Um, after Gabon, what are your plans? <laughs> Well, I'm 67. I don't think the plans go too much further than that. Um, I, I don't understand retirement, so um, retirement's not something that I even think about. So I'll be busy. Gabon's a huge project. I'll never finish it in my life. Um, it's got lots of challenges. Um, so that'll keep me busy. And, uh, you know, I've got other things. I've got a business called Safari Investment Advisory, where we advise safari businesses about the business side of, the, of what they do and the uh, corporate structuring and fundraising and all those sort of things. So I'm always busy, but um, so I'll never, uh, there will always be something else to do. Um, other than, are there other introductions or major changes you'd like to make to the Ritzbrate Reserve besides buffalo? Look, there are only... That's from Steffi Marks. Yeah, the only species that, that we would continue to introduce are small, more cryptic, Predators like uh, serval and, oh, and uh, lynx, so the, yeah, but not, not they're enough. not enough. I think so more jackals, a couple know. of those, and then you know the buffalo would remain a challenge, but it's not something that I think we can solve very easily. So um, those would be the, the species, but there's no um, sort of well-known antelope or things like that, that that would normally occur here that aren't here. Yeah. And we're quite lucky with the, the species we do have, and then why is it, well, maybe a few more blackback jackal, they sit No, blackback jackal, uh, no, they're, they're around, I think we'll, we'll see them more. They've not been as successful in breeding as I thought no. they would be. We've got a pair here. Yeah, but I just don't see the babies with them, which no, is No, I haven't seen them, I actually haven't found strange. a jackal. So we, we, what we decided to do, the jackals are a, um, are a reservoir of rabies, mm. and, um, and domestic dogs as well. And people blame bats and all those things, and it turns out that it's not bats at all. And um, so when we had a rabies outbreak, which the almost resident wild dog pack yeah. got taken out by rabies at a den on a next door property, um, we decided that we would bring jackals back. But before COVID and before uh, herd immunity became a thing, we wanted to do a herd immunity exercise with the blackback jackals. So with Phil Evans from Kai and Lovo and Rhino Revolution, we introduced, can't remember now, I think it was close to 20 yeah. uh, jackals. The, 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 dogs yeah, the idea was to get to about 70% of the jackals here having some sort of herd immunity. And those that had survived were probably immune anyhow. Yeah. And so we vaccinated these jackals when we brought them in and we vaccinated them before we released them again. And so hopefully we won't get these big outbreaks of rabies again. Um, uh, Michael Fleetwood, given what things do you think still need to improve within the safari industry, particularly after the end, uh, impact of the pandemic? Look, uh, it... it the safari industry has done incredibly well in terms of, of um, creating a revenue stream from which you can discount to a capital value because people are strange. They don't look after revenue, they look after value. And so what's happened is you've created enormously valuable safari lodges that produce good revenue streams. And so um, 
the tendency in the industry that's most negative is that when they get full, they tend to add beds. Oh, and that's a negative. Down the and road. You, start, you start working against yourself. And uh, you start creating hotels in the bush and then your impacts are higher and all those kind of things. So the trouble is that your alternative is when you're declining bookings all the time because you're running full, people get irritated and so on and so forth. So they think they must add more rooms. But the reality is one of the doyens of the safari industry way back, Mike Rattray, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. He had one of these Rattrayisms. He had sort of strange... Not strange, he actually had very sensible ideas. Some of them could have been nuanced a bit, but one of them was that whenever your occupancy passes 84%, you need to double your rate. So he used to go along, and I remember back in the day, it was $100 in the, uh, the late 1980s. In the early 1990s, he decided things had picked up, and he changed from $100 to $200 a night. And everybody said, oh, it's amazing. And, and, he, and his argument, which actually turned out to be true. He dropped from 80% to 40% and then he would build up over the years to 80% and double again. So um, that's how he handled it. He didn't add more beds. No, and also more beds are always a, oh, a fun one. And you get very busy, busy reserves and busy... And lots of staff often. and all those kind of things. And then they've got to have housing and then there's vehicles moving in and out and you've got to feed all the staff. And so now you get service vehicles coming and going. So there's a negative side to the photographic safari industry that needs to be managed. Just an observation from Di. You two must be so proud of each other. But does Kevin ever disagree with Brent's methods? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll pick up on one that most of you like, which is I don't like naming, naming animals. animals. <laughs> so, yes, we do. Yeah. Um, uh, what can the, this is from Jennifer. Uh, what can the average person do to help in promoting the conservation message to others to feel like they are having some sort of positive impact? Well, awareness, um, understanding some of the principles, um, Conservation tends to be viewed, there's, there's this term called conservationist, and I, I don't like the word conservationist. Well, we called you one tonight. Yeah, well, <laughs> conservationists, in my opinion, are, are lots of people who have a media profile and talk a lot about things. Uh, I, I think that the practice of conservation, the science and all those kind of things, are much more complicated. So I'll use one of my favorite expressions I developed since working in the climate change mitigation space. If your solution for a complicated problem sounds like a slogan, you haven't proved you've got a solution. You've, all you've proven is that you don't understand the problem. And conservation is one of those things. It's enormously complicated. When you've got a simple answer, for example, there's a big debate in the UK at the moment about allowing uh, trophy hunters to bring back their trophies into the UK. And the animal rights movement, uh, which is very negative for conservation, I know I can get crucified for this, but, but I always call it as I see it. Um, if, you, if you value the animal only, you will destroy the environment and you will destroy the animal ultimately. So you have to look after ecosystems and environments. That's what you look after. The animals are a part of that, an integral part of that. So the, the idea that that um, banning trophy hunting is a good thing is a really, really bad idea. It's oversimplistic. I'm not a hunter. I don't hunt. I have no interest in hunting whatsoever. But there are vast areas of Mapani that, for example, keep the Okavango Delta as it is, that only a hunter would go into and pay money to be there. And if they weren't there because they sprayed the tsetse fly there a few years ago, well, a few years, 10, 15 years ago, um, they're perfectly suitable for cattle. The cattle will move in, the animals will move out, the Okavango will die because that's the summer grazing range for all the animals that live in the Okavango. So simple solutions means you don't understand it. So that's probably one of the key messages. The law of there. unintended consequences. The law of unintended consequences. Conservation is complicated, it's difficult, it requires very hard decisions to be taken with very good data and there are some very good conservation management um, people out there and the media and the social media take them down as though this cancel culture and these kind of things. They are just ignorant and we should not be listening to ignorant people. Well, there we go. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks Dad for coming onto the show. My pleasure. Um, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. 
And uh, we will see you next week uh, for That's Wild Again. But also don't forget to join us for the private live drives, the pack drives um, on the week coming up. I think Charles will be putting out the schedule tomorrow. So go have a look there. And if you haven't downloaded the Painted Dog TV app, now is your chance. Go do it. Get your photos on to next week's episode of That's Wild. But for us here in a windy Root Spread Game Reserve, good night. Cheers. making so much noise right here. Yeah. Okay, Andrew, you just need to get to me. Yeah. And then you'll be able to see. There we go. Fantastic. So, just in case you thought we were telling fibs. There you go, he's about to go stand on VM's critter cam. VM, last time was the lions that broke your camera. I think tonight's gonna be a rhino. Oh, the elephants also broke it, VM's telling me in my ear. There is a, a great, great, big gray bottom. Um, have you got, Andrew, another meter? Wait, just wait before you move. We've got Jana and Basil cable bashing behind Andrew currently. time